Product Breakfast Club. Product Breakfast Club. Product Breakfast Club. Product Breakfast Club. Product. Hello, Jake. How are you doing, man? Hey, John. How's it going? How you doing there? What's it like in Berlin this evening? Uh, man, it is dark, it is rainy, it is wet. I love it. Ah, uh, nice. Well, it's just like Ireland. <laughs> I'm Jake Knapp. I'm here in San Francisco, where it is the opposite of all those things. It's sunny and bright and lovely. And I'm a writer designer. John, who are you? Hello, my name is Jonathan, originally from Ireland, now in Berlin, running a design studio called AJ and Smart. We design products, and I'm a product designer. Well, hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the non New York Times bestselling one of the two of us. <laughs> Watch it, Jake. I'm coming after you, man. That's right. That's right. I always, I always forget who's who. And that's the way that I remember. So what's going on today? So it's just about to kick off for me over here. I'm about to embark on quite a few weeks of travel for work. I'm pretty excited about it, actually. So tomorrow I'm heading to Denmark to our good friends at Lego. It's going to be a really fun few days up there. That does sound like fun. Yeah, man. It's like, I really love the guys at Lego. It's just such a cool company. Then I'm heading to Madrid in Spain. I hope all you Spanish people listening are 100% on board with how good my Spanish accent is. There's just a lot coming up. I'm going to be going to Turkey, potentially Malaysia, potentially Japan. Is this for work? Yeah. No. Hell yeah. What? Man, you know, it's just, I'm a businessman. High-flying businessman. You're a big-time operator, BTO. Look out. <laughs> I'm also not finished with my list of places that I'm going. And I'm also going to be coming to San Francisco to meet you at some point in March, probably. Then that's probably a good enough chunk of travel for a while. But I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to reading on the plane. You know what I mean? Just getting some of that reading done. I love it. I love being on planes. That is a lot. You're going to be on planes a lot. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. That's more travel. Yeah. You travel a lot. Well, for me... I'll be seeing you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I completely forgot that. I'm also going to be going to all the Nordic countries. Yeah, we're going to be in Helsinki. We're going to be in Copenhagen and Stockholm doing our workshops. So I'll see you there. Yeah. And then I'll just be right back here just chilling in California. But the big thing going on for me is the new book, which comes out in September, which is not design or business related. It is a sort of a time management book. And that is in copy editing. We're looking at the interior layout, working on the cover design, kind of sweet. It's got 1600 people to sign up to be test readers of the introduction and just kind of figuring out what to do with all those reactions and feedback and all that stuff that when you're building a product, you have to sort out like what patterns do you pay attention to? Which ones do you not pay attention yeah. to? And for the ones that you care about, or do you think that, I mean, you care about all of them, but the ones that you think like, we should do something about this. How do you decide what to do so that you keep true to the product, in this case, a book? And which ones do you just say, you know, that's not us. We're not going to be able to solve that person's way of looking at things. And that's been yeah. interesting, you know, because a book is like really tightened down where the team is like so much smaller and the product can never be fixed once it's out in the world. So it's been interesting. Why do you think your book is going to be a success? Why do you hope it will be a success? Yeah, the basic idea with the book is it's called Make Time. And in fact, it's secretly on Amazon. I'm not supposed to like promote it yet because oh. we don't have a cover design yet. So if you go and look, you're going to be like, what? This looks like garbage. But the book's called Make Time. And the idea is that you can make time each day for something that's important to you. And you can do that by having one priority in mind each day. You can do that by eliminating distraction when it's time to do the thing. And you can do that by boosting your energy throughout the day, like your physical and mental energy. And we talk about a bunch of different tactics for doing that. I wrote this with John Zaratsky, one of my co-authors from the book Sprint. And so the reason why I think, you know, we bothered to write it is we think there's a need for this. I mean, we feel the need for it in our own lives. And we wrote it with the idea that hopefully this would be useful to other folks and not just us. There's a lot of people who write stuff in this genre, and it'll have to be because people think, well, the way that they wrote it is easy to use, like a product. It's like, it's easy to use. It fits my life in a good way. I like the tone of it. I like the way they're talking about it. You know, we're going to talk about things in a little bit of a different way than other folks do. And, is it, you know, you can do what you can to try to be sure that you're right about those things before you launch the book, but you can't be 100% sure. So it's a gamble. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the reasons that it's going to be successful 
one of the reasons I think people are going to buy it is because it takes a lot of these, you know, like Tim Ferriss books and a lot of these self-help or life optimizing books and creates a formula for it. So it's almost like how Sprint created a step-by-step -step recipe for all of these broad and vague design thinking related things. This book creates a recipe out of all of these, you know, self-help things, at least from what I'm looking at, if I look at all these, you know, how to do better to-do lists, how to do this, how to do that, I think make time is a nice, simple recipe. And I think it's also going to be great for people who do not want to go as deep as Tim Ferriss and just want like a book that can improve their lives immediately. Anyone listening to this and thinking I'm trying to make an advert for it, number one, you shouldn't buy it because then Jake gets money and I don't get money. <laughs> uh, number two, it sucks. I read it already. Yeah, it's the worst book. True. Actually, wait a second. Can, <laughs> am I going to get like a front cover quote? You know, because it's super important what I say. Well, your face is going to be so big on the front cover that your quote's actually going to be on the back. <laughs> yeah, okay. I mean, we can negotiate. So... I think what it should say is not as good as a Tim Ferriss book, but easier to read. How about that? Bingo. I love it. I want a consultation from you. So okay. maybe uh, a couple of episodes back, I told you that we kind of changed around the roles of the leadership at AJ and Smart. Leadership is just me and my co-founder, Michael. And I took over the role of the CEO. For me, it's obviously making great partnerships for the company and thinking about how this company grows and sustains itself over the next X amount of years. So it's about looking at the short term, keeping the business running, keeping people happy and long term, like 10 years from now, why does AJ and Smart exist? Okay, that's the background. Today, I did this short automatic exercise we talked about in the last episode where I try to look at my day to day work at AJ and Smart and look at where the problems are and look for some shortcuts. And one of the things I came up against and one of the problems that I realized I have is that strangely, I have these like blocks of free time in my day now, which I never had before because I was doing the design sprints and I was doing a lot of product design work. And I tend to fill them with super reactionary work, like checking email, jumping onto Instagram. It feels like super unsatisfying reactionary work. I have no idea if you can answer this, but... My solution to this was to ask you for your advice on what to do. Obviously, I should be doing something like, you know, writing or something like that. But I'm just unsure right now what I actually want to do. Do you have any idea what I should be doing in these kind of unstructured blocks so that I just don't become this reactionary, you know, mess? Well, I think the first question is, what do you want to do? I have no idea. I'm doing the things that I want to do, AJ and SmartWise, during the times that I'm doing them. The times when you're busy. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. I mean, I really enjoy doing the videos. I really enjoy doing the writing and stuff like that. But I guess it's more about like, what's the most valuable thing that I can contribute to the company? And a lot of that is doing things like this, doing the podcast. I guess it could potentially be good for AJ and Smart in the long term. But yeah, there's just this like messiness. It's probably going to hurt you guys in the long term, honestly. You must have had that when you quit your job. Yeah. Well, even when I had a job, the thing that you should keep in mind is I've never been a CEO of something. And I've, in fact, actively sought to avoid managing people. I've, I've had some very brief experience managing people. And I like people. No, you don't. More or less. But managing, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of time. So I actually come at this not necessarily with expertise about what's good for the company. And if you feel like you're already doing the things that you want to be doing for the company, that's good. I do think in a broad sense, there is a weird notion that what you ought to do each day is fill every hour that you can with work. Wake up as soon as you can get to work after you've had breakfast, maybe you've been able to squeeze in some exercise, whatever you get to work. And then you should stay there as yeah. long as you can kind of keep yourself propped up, right? Filling every hour with busyness. And then at the end of that time, you should exhaust it like, crawl home and watch Netflix. Like that's kind <laughs> of our world and like it's a bit of an exaggeration, but it's not a total exaggeration. And this notion of like 40 hours a week, whatever the hours per week thing is, it never goes down. It's never like, oh, you know, actually it doesn't necessarily take 60 full hours, 50 full hours, 40 full hours, whatever. Like it doesn't necessarily take all of those hours to get something done. And right. you may be better off not trying to fill those hours artificially or just trying to fill those hours with what is yet another thing I can do for the company, you may yeah. be better off actually doing something completely different, something that's more of a personal project, something that is more of a long-term bet on something, something that's more of a rest, you know, something that's more like a physical break or a mental mm -hmm. break. 
you might be better off doing something totally different. You don't necessarily have to optimize and that could be okay. That's true. Yeah, that's an interesting way to think about it. And I'm not talking about these huge swaths of time. I'm thinking like there's these hour and a half bits and pieces that I didn't have before, which I now have. And I mean, obviously, I want to read more and I want to do these things. But somehow the way that they're jammed into the day kind of randomly makes me end up not actually using them for anything. You know what I mean? I end up doing busy work. Like you mentioned, people feel like they need to fill the entire time with busy work. I think that's what I'm actually doing right now. I think I'm overly doing busy work that I don't think has a huge contribution to the company. Definitely iterative, but not really like these big contributions. And yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe I shouldn't be trying to over-optimize that kind of shit. I mean, obviously, to the extent you can batch so that you have batches of free time and so that you have batches of busy work, because the busy work has to happen too. I mean, I don't even have a job and I still have to do a lot of that stuff. Like it is part of life. But I should also say I too struggle with this. I'll have like a coffee with somebody and I'll mean to write all day, but then I'll have like a call in the afternoon and I'll have this little wedge of time in the middle. And it's like, oh, it's not quite enough time to really dig into something. You can do your best to batch things. You can do your best to have habits that help you snap into what in the book we call laser mode, like you're just like focusing, but it's not always possible and you shouldn't beat yourself up if you can't always do it. Imagine that you went to the dentist or something like let's say you had to go to the dentist. Don't have to imagine that like as an Irish person, I'm there all the time. I'm not dissing you because of your teeth. <laughs> I'm there all the time, man. Yeah. So imagine you got to go to the dentist and you show up and they're like, sorry, appointment's canceled. We're going to have to reschedule it. And you were like, oh man, okay. I had like the next hour and a half. I don't have anything to do. And I'm not even at my office. Oh, I left my phone at home. What would you do then? Like, you'd be like, okay, I guess I'll like go have a cup of coffee or like, I'll walk back to work. I mean, I really can't do anything for the next hour and a half or whatever. And it feels really free. And it like, I mean, this sounds super cheesy, but it like recharges your spirit to have times like that. And If you can actually allow yourself, give yourself, you know, be kind to yourself and say, hey, maybe it's okay for me to just have this be like an opening. I think that a lot of times those openings, those gaps, those times if you just like go for a walk and think or whatever, I don't know if you can go for a walk in January in uh, Berlin, it's probably horrible, but you'll just die. Yeah. But if you can, a lot of times the thinking that might happen from that or like the rest and then the resulting like boost of energy you might have later on is so much more valuable than like chipping away or fiddling away or like doing something that often feels like a waste. So wasting time might actually be buying you time. It definitely has me thinking about where I said that I was going to take a lot more time off to read. I've been doing a little bit of that. I've definitely been taking off a few mornings for reading and for a little bit more exercise. But for sure, I'm probably over stressing about not optimizing every moment. Maybe I should really just like get up and go for a walk for a half an hour or something instead of just sitting around looking to be busy. This is like a CEO thing, right? The other thing you're doing by doing that is you're showing your team where the values are, right? Like, and you're showing your team like, hey, you don't have to be busy every hour, every 15 minutes of the day here. So there's not 40 hours worth of work. I value your life ahead of your work here and like have a moment yeah. of your life right now. Like, that's fine. No company's doing that. Like, that's not happening normally. Like, that's the way it should be though. I mean, just set an example of chilling sometimes, just kicking back, it's fine. I guess the way I set the examples is that I am mostly, you know, one of the first people to leave the office. We don't do that like hero thing at AJ and Smart where we're looking to be the last person in. Michael, my co-founder, because he's a family, he usually is home pretty early. And I think that it is something we do value, right? We do value. Yeah. Work is work. Even though it's taking up a lot of your life, it is still, you know, not your life. So interesting. It's a weird thing. What do I do with all this extra free time now that I've built a company with 20 people who do all the work that I used to do? (laughs) (laughs) Obviously, I'm traveling a shitload as well now, but there is free time and I'm not really built for using it because I used to be the person who did everything. Well, yeah, It's a super weird scenario. I mean, another part too is when you're doing that traveling, you listed off a ton of traveling and I know you did it mostly to brag. Yeah. Some of it might not even be real. I am so badass, Jake. I'm skeptical that you have work to do in Japan and Malaysia. I don't know. Dude, seem... watch my Instagram story. Oh, sorry, you're not using Instagram. It's going to be Photoshop. Yeah, I don't even know. <laughs> when you're doing that traveling, it's going to drain your battery to some extent to have all that traveling. It'll be fun, I'm sure, but like it's 
going to be tiring. And it's also good, I think, yeah. to zoom out and think like when you think of the big picture of your year, there's times, no matter what kind of work you're doing, where things are more intense. And then there's times when there's slack. Hopefully there's some time when there's a little slack. And when there's that slack, it's okay to like build up your yeah. chi so that you're ready for those more intense times. It's weird because you can't really 100% predict those slack times and when those less slack times are going to happen. And if I could predict them, I guess what I would do is I would like work out every single day or climb a mountain. There's no mountains around here, but you know, I would already plan on doing more side things. But I guess one of the things that's bugging me right now, one of the things I need to figure out and using the shortcut omatic exercise, I figured that out today as well, is that I've spent now so much time building this company, right? Like all of my side projects and all of my hobbies are catered to by AJ and Smart because business, you know, it is kind of my hobby. Even this podcast, right? It's a little bit different from my actual day-to-day business, but still it is related a little bit to product design and all that kind of stuff. Hello. Oh, Kit We've just got a in. Kit walking in the background here. <laughs> hey, Kit. Hey, hey, I told them that it's fine to walk in during the podcast these days because it's a super cash podcast, you know? <laughs> I think right now what I'm slowly transitioning into, and actually I'm excited about a lot of this travel because a lot of it I'll be traveling alone and I'll be on these quite long flights alone. And I enjoy that. I enjoy that time to be silent and think about what I might want to do. And yeah, there's a couple of things on my mind that I want to try out over the next few months. And I think it's going to be pretty exciting. So Jake. Yeah. What is the largest audience you've ever spoken to at a conference? Oh, I think, yeah, two, maybe three people. <laughs> I think I did one that once it was 2000. I recently in October did one that was 1600. So I can bring up that memory okay. really fast. Let's just say for bragging rights around 2000 people. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So for me, it, for me, I think it's actually less. I think the biggest uh, conference I've ever spoken at was maybe like, Maybe 1,000 people and are the average kind of, you know, thing is, yeah, around that. So still not a big boy. But think a about this. A lot. Don't feel bad about that. That's yeah. a lot. All right. All right. All right. All right. Good okay. Audience. But Jake, do you realize that every week when we do this podcast, we're essentially doing like a weird little mini conference for now over 4,500 people? Oh, that's weird. Do you ever feel that pressure? <laughs> oh, that's weird. Now I'm going to lock up. I'm not going to be able to say a darn thing the rest of the podcast. I guess it feels different because we can't see them. Yeah. They could just be like, Psh, whatever, and like bail anytime. Whereas in the conference, they're sort of stuck there. Exactly. We can't hear them clap. So there's like, we have no vested interest in like doing a good job. We can't hear them clap. I can hear them clap. If we could hear them clap, I would work harder at this probably. That's an interesting thought. It wasn't actually my thought. It was talking to Richard. He runs like a gym in Berlin. And I was saying we have like this many people with like around 4,500 subscribers now. Like I really want to have 10,000 or 20,000 or whatever. And he's like, you know, that's like speaking to over 4,000 people every time you do a podcast. And I was like, oh, shit. (laughs) Shouldn't have put that stuff in the last podcast. (laughs) No, it was actually cool. It was a cool feeling. It was like, you know what? That is pretty cool. Because I guess for you and I, we still see this podcast as something like as an experiment that's going to fall apart any moment, you know? I think it's already fallen apart. Yeah, it has fallen apart. But I think this episode, potentially, it's either going to have the best audio we've ever had, or it's going to not work. (laughs) Or no audio. Yeah, or no audio, and we'll have to redo the entire thing. If you're listening to it, it worked. (laughs) Well, if you're listening to it, either the audio is way better than the last few episodes, or it's way worse, or there's no episode. (laughs) Oh, man. Yeah, that's how it's working around here. Just to everyone who's listening and the people who are sending us all of these really nice messages, I think it doesn't really matter how many conferences I've spoken. I've never had a bigger reaction to something I've been doing compared to the podcast. Maybe it's just because they listen to us for so many hours you know, every episode is like an hour. We've done like 11 episodes now. There are people who've been completely brainwashed by our voices. <laughs> the reactions that I'm getting from it are really, really cool. And we do not have a problem with people giving us positive feedback on this podcast. We can take it. We can take it. We will endure if you have any positive feedback. We can endure it. I think we've talked about this before, but why do people ever not give something five-star reviews? We've talked about it. I'm sure we've been over it. But it's like, uh, come on, just stop. Put the book down. Put the movie down. Stop listening to the album. Don't uninstall the app. Like, whatever. Nobody needs your two-star reviews, one-star reviews. Like, no, no. Yeah. Just stop. Just stop. Nobody needs that. 
It's good you can say criticisms. That's one thing. Yeah. You know, just give everybody five stars for everything they do. That's what I say. Yeah. And the cool thing about this podcast is that like we're not making one cent from it. It's literally a complete selfish thing for myself and Jake. So if you do hate it and you do turn it off, it's totally fine. We won't be offended if you just like say, ah, I don't want to listen to this podcast anymore. I'm not getting anything out of it. I'll be offended. I cry a tear. One tear every time. Yeah? Yeah. I get super aggressive every time I see a bad review. <laughs> but actually on the German store, I have the German uh, podcast store. We have like all five-star reviews. We have 27 five-star reviews, which is... Uh, How about that? Not too bad, my friend. Whenever you look at the Amazon reviews of your book, it doesn't take you to a good, happy place. One time I looked at the Amazon reviews in Germany of Sprint, and this person was like, it was all right, but it was ruined by too many dad jokes. Don't try to like act like something you're not. And I was like, but I'm a I dad. A dad. I, what else can I do? <laughs> That's all I got. Like, I'm just being me. I'm just being me out there. Come oh, on. Oh, man. No, oh, man. The Germans love you, man. The Germans love you. Reviews are tough. Germans, man, the Germans are tough. I didn't even know that the Germans knew what a dad joke was. That's some sophisticated English to know what a dad joke ein is. Vatervitz. <laughs> this is ein Vatervitz. I don't know if that's the direct translation. So look, I have a segue, Jake, but you kind of ruined the segue. You really ruined the segue. Uh, so the segue is, it's like we're speaking at a pretty big conference every Tuesday. Okay. Let's talk about conferences. Oh! oh! That was good. <laughs> that was good. You landed, you stuck the landing on that segue. And now, 30 minutes into the podcast, we're going to talk about some product First stuff. topic. First topic. All First right. topic. All right, Jake, we're going into the topic. And the topic today is conferences. I'm kind of worried about talking about this because I obviously can't hold back my real opinions, um, but I'm really worried about offending people because I don't want to offend anybody, so I'm not going to be naming <laughs> any conferences. I really, I genuinely don't want to offend anybody, and I'm not that type of person, So, I, and I don't want to be like, you know, I just don't want to come across like a total dick, but at the same time, I need... <laughs> but at the same time, you are, so... <laughs> At the same time, I don't want to hold back just so that I kind of get along with the industry. I just don't really care about that kind of thing. Okay, so Jake, All right. I have been going to conferences for about 10 years now. I've been to quite a lot of design conferences, quite a lot of tech conferences, and kind of these conferences that mix those two. And I would say that for the most part, and now I'm just talking about going to these conferences as a participant first or as an audience member, for the most part, I feel like they are 90% filler. I feel like they're often really messily organized as if the people had, you know, never done this before even though it's maybe their 10th version of it. I also get the feeling that a lot of the reason the conference exists, a lot of the reasons people even speak at these conferences is just so they can look good and show the other people who are speaking at the conferences how cool they all are, you know, for speaking <laughs> at this conference. I've been to my fair share of pre- and post-conference dinners. Now, I've met some really, really great people at these things, by the way. And I almost everybody who organizes conferences, I've really loved them. But these dinners, I feel extremely uncomfortable in because people are generally trying to one-up each other about their careers. And I just cannot do that. I just don't care enough. I just want to have jokes. I just want to drink and, you know, laugh about the kind of yeah. absurdity of being a conference speaker. And like, I'm always kind of self-deprecating and I'm like, ah, you know, it's actually pretty funny that I'm here because I don't really feel like I have so much to contribute. And they're like, yeah, well, you know, I've spoken at South by Southwest like 80,000 times and it's the same <laughs> presentation and I'm actually pretty popular on Twitter. I'm like, oh, okay. Can we just make jokes, please? <laughs> so that's like as a speaker side, but as the conference goer, I'm really down on it. I've given up on it. I don't enjoy going to these conferences. I've learned very little over the last 10 years going to these things. And I also don't really love speaking at them. I think it makes me a little bit uncomfortable, number one, which I kind of enjoy. I don't know. I think Jason said it in the last episode. There's like no debate. It's just people are there to make each other look good. And I don't feel like there's any like serious debate or content or learnings that you can get out of them. Most of the talks that I see from people who I also respect, they're just like so vague and they don't really tell you anything. It's like they're trying to hide all of their secrets underneath buzzwords and they just piss me off. What happens is that I'll go with a couple of people from AJ and Smart, we'll pay for it and we'll like go there for the first day. And by the end of the first day, we're all like, should we just like never, ever come back to this again and like just not do the second day? We super often these days just bail on conferences because they're just so bad. 
Basically, what I'm saying is I'm done with going to conferences. I don't necessarily enjoy speaking at them either. I probably don't really want to speak at too many conferences anymore, especially design ones. Well, don't worry because, I mean, we can we can boast all we want about our 4,500 users, but there's probably plenty of conference <laughs> organizers who will not ever hear this podcast. So you could probably just let loose, That's let true. rip. You know, I was listening to you. I stopped making eye contact with the webcam because I was taking some notes. I was taking some notes about three things. Writing on his leg. Things. I got another one of these triple lens answers for you. I think the first lens is product. Conference is a product and the talks are product and they're a kind of product that's actually hard to do well. It's not easy to assemble a conference in a way that you got consistently high quality speakers, that the pacing is good, that the audience size is right, that people have time to like do the other thing that's good about conferences, which is like chat with each other and converse. And putting that kind of product together and making it excellent is just not easy. And I think a lot of the conferences, even if people have done it a bunch of times, just like there's products of all kinds out in the world that have been made for years and years and aren't any good. It's hard to get it right. So I think sometimes they're just up against being, it's a hard thing. The other thing is that it's hard to put together a good talk. It's really, really hard, I think, to put together a good talk and to be a compelling speaker, right? And agree. when you ask somebody to go up there, and a lot of times folks are asked because they work somewhere cool or they've worked on something cool or they're well-known, maybe they're well-known on Twitter or they're well, you know, whatever. That is not a guarantee that they're going to give a good talk. And so the people who go up there, they're being asked to do something difficult. It's a hard thing to do and you need a lot of practice and you need a lot of it to be really intentional to give a good talk or to moderate a panel so that people do argue and do go after each other. And it's tough. And a lot of times the folks who are selected, that's not something they do a lot of the time. And so they're trying to do something hard. It's hard. I agree. It's hard to run something like that. We also run these like, okay, not so giant events, but like 100 people with pretty high ticket price. And I know it's even extremely difficult to do something like that. However, there are things that I think design conferences in particular think it's fine to get away with. And they do it over and over and over again, because I've been to some of these conferences multiple times and they never learn from their mistakes. And they also don't care. Number one, the show itself and the pacing They just don't care. That's the thing. They think that if the right names, the big Twitter people are on stage, it doesn't really matter if the lights aren't working or if the microphone is squeaking or if the keynote is uh, (laughs) not actually in sync or if the place is freezing cold or whatever. They get stressed out about it. But the next year you come back and it's the exact same. And you don't see that in other industries. You don't get away with that in other shows that you spend potentially $2,000 on or $1,000 on. Like if I went to see Coldplay and they didn't have the lights on and for $80, by the way, I'd be super pissed. I'd be like, Coldplay, come on, sort yourself out, Coldplay. (laughs) But then I'd fly to New York to go to a conference and the air conditioning is not working. The screen isn't working. Everything's broken. The food is cold and there's like giant queues for the toilet and the toilets are broken. Yeah, okay, I spent like 20 times the amount for this than I did on a Coldplay concert, and I'm getting shitty service. And the other thing is, so I just think they get away with murder because there's low standards in this industry. Seriously, there's extremely low standards in the whole UX and design world. You can really get away with anything. I could start a conference tomorrow in a toilet. (laughs) You know why people would rate it highly? It's because they want pictures of themselves at the conference showing that they're doing something. Okay, the second thing, is that the networking at these events sucks so much. The one thing that they should be good at, they really suck at and they don't think about it. What they do, and this is something I find super strange, and I know some conferences, I'm not talking about every conference, by the way. Most conferences I've been to, they set up a club night or you go to a bar and then you all go to a big club. Nobody can talk. It's super loud. There's no like effort put into oh, mingling. I hate that. I hate it when it's loud. Why does it have to be loud? Oh, God. Come on, Dad. No, I'm a cool kid, right? I'm a cool person who likes to get drunk. You're the cool young person. Yeah, you're drinking all the time. I saw you drinking at the beginning of the podcast. It's no good. I still don't like it. What we do, we actually try to put some effort into, you know, when you arrive at one of our events, you maybe get someone else's name and you're kind of forced to speak to them or something like that. At the conferences I go to, there's zero effort put into this. I'm super pissed when that happens. I'm just like, come on, there's just no effort. They're just putting this thing on. They can make money out of it. They're just putting it on over and over again. And one of my favorite conferences that I've been to, the first time I went there was really cool. They actually did put effort into that. Second time, they got rid of that effort. Third time, it was literally a piece of crap. Literally a piece of crap? Because that means it was a piece of crap. Literally. Okay. All right. 
You showed up to the conference and you were just like, this is just a turd. Just a poo. I don't even know how to get into the door. I asked people on Instagram to send me their favorite conferences. A lot of the ones that I got were the ones I'd been to and hated. <laughs> One that I got, though, multiple times is a conference called EpiCurrents. I think I'm saying it right. EpiCurrents. Yeah, I've heard people talk about that. This is the kind of shit that I like. That looks cool. You know, you all go on a retreat, essentially. And I think if I was ever to do a conference, which I really don't have any intention of doing right now, I think I would do it like as a small retreat thing like that. I really love that idea. People who actually want to come to something like that, maybe the ticket price is um, higher than usual. And maybe you just have like you and me and Jason Freed. I think that one's invite only. They're never going to invite us. Fuck. Yeah, we're not cool enough. Yeah. Hey, I told you I was cool. Uh, I know, but nobody believes us. I, I think we're cool, you know, <laughs> Damn but it. nobody believes uh, us. We're cool, Jake. Now, back to the main event, the third lens of this thing. <laughs> the main event, my ass. One of the things about this, you know, I was talking about the format being hard, but also just the idea that like you're going to get information from like a day or a multi-days full of people talking at you. The other thing is that like the competition for ways to disseminate information today Versus like 10, 20 years ago, like the amount of stuff, the ease to put something on YouTube to make a podcast. I mean, we're a couple of jokers. We have a podcast. I mean, you can easily make one to write medium articles or to get information from a book. Like all these other ways that you can get information are so much more accessible and more scannable. And like, yeah, if I pick up a book and I start reading it and I'm like, this isn't interesting to me. I just put it down, throw it away. Like I don't need to like sit there. We're holding conferences to a standard that like there's competition that's much better, just readily available. You know, I have been to conferences and I will name names of some good ones. Yeah, hit me. Mind the product in London. That was the one I was mentioning. Yes. That was like 1600 people. I was talking to the organizer, this guy, Martin, and he was saying, you know, all year round, I'm going to conferences, watching the speakers and trying to find speakers who I think will give a good talk. And all together, we'll make like a good program. And it really showed. It was super yeah. interesting, you know. I have not been to many conferences except for ones I was speaking at. Prior to me being like a person who got invited to speak at them, I didn't go. When I worked at Microsoft, like, I don't know, we didn't have budget or like nobody ever talked about us going to conferences. I didn't even know how to do it. So I never went to one. And then when I got a job at Google, I did go to this one that was really impactful to me that Adaptive Path put on. I don't know if they still do oh, conferences, yeah. but it was like half conference, half workshop. And it had a lot of those elements you're talking right. about where you would meet people at your table and you were doing activities. So like the stuff really stuck. And I learned a bunch from that. But then the other element of it is that you and I, I think a lot of people really like conferences. And I think you and I are kind of jerks. Like we are really impatient. And that's, I think that's true, right? That's kind of why we like. I don't, I actually, I don't agree with you there. You're not going to buy that. No. <laughs> As well, I've been to a lot of these conferences with workshops. And you know how many times I've built a fucking wallet in a design thinking workshop over the last 10 years? <laughs> if I have to build another wallet, I'm going to headbutt somebody. <laughs> it's just that I think that these conferences, they try to cater for people of all skill levels instead of just saying, this is like a beginner's UX conference. And I think that that would be fine then. I wouldn't mind... You know, if I accidentally had to build another wallet, I'd be like, oh, yeah, they're introducing me to design thinking again for the 15th time, even though this is like supposed to be an experts roundtable thing. They try to make as much money as possible by catering to as broad an audience as possible. And in the process, you don't get to go deep on anything. I've met some people at conferences who have definitely changed the path of my life. I'm glad I went to them. And I think that like, uh, oh, my phone, how professional. My phone just <laughs> went is, off. This is a real podcast. I'm talking to you the way I would talk to someone else if I was not being recorded when I talk about conferences. And I know people will be a little bit annoyed when they hear this. And I know people will think I'm a bit of a dickhead. But I think conferences need to step up their game. I think I've also just maybe not been going to the right ones, but I've gone to enough that I feel like they are these brag fests. That was the third lens. The first lens was product. The second one was the format. Okay, the third lens is insecurity. And the thing that's weird, you'll see people who are like, you would think like that person has got it going on. Like they got everything going their way. They're working at that cool company, working on that cool thing that just whatever. They're managing a ton of the vice president or whatever. Everybody's insecure. And it brings out, I think, kind of the worst of the insecurity when you're at a conference, whether you're an attendee or whether you're a speaker, because there's all these other people and 
we just worry that everybody else knows what's going on and everybody else is like really self-confident and everybody's actually kind of worried about it. If the people are speaking, they're kind of like nervous that their talk's not going to go over well. Or if they're talking to another speaker, they're worried that, well, that speaker's a big deal, but I'm not, you know, and everybody, I mean, it's just like the insecurity is so plain. And I think that is part of what yeah. brings it down is that people can't be loose and comfortable and just talk, which is actually hard to do. It actually is hard to do that. That's part of what makes it a tough format is a lot of insecurity. Yeah, it's a lot of missed opportunities, which makes me excited if I would want to do something like that. But then I look into the economics of doing a conference and I'm like, hell no, I'll just do our workshops where people actually can learn stuff and we can charge our ticket prices for that. And a conference just sounds way too stressful. All right, here's what I would want to do if I would do a conference. First, I would call it practical product conference. It would be very clearly about products and very clearly about practical advice. I would probably just do like maybe like a two day thing, like with the talks and with the uh, workshop on the second day. But I think I would have like maximum three speakers. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So it wouldn't be like one of these that I'm trying to sell the conference tickets by having all these famous people. And I think it would just be going as deep as possible and having very long Q&As. I actually opened up a Q&A in a recent conference I was at, and it was a disaster because they didn't really want me to do that. <laughs> in terms of, from a technical point of view, it was a disaster. But from a actually my talk being useful point of view, it was definitely the best talk I ever did because the people in the audience were curious about things. The more people asked me, the more people were willing to open up and ask questions. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, and I think at our events, the events that we run with you, Jake, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the Q&As are some of the most useful parts of the entire thing. We ran a workshop here at AJ and Smart this week, and the Q&A was it's just amazing. You also connect with people during the Q&A, and other people in the audience see that these people have maybe similar problems. I think I would really do it like that. It would be like three talks, big Q&As, a lot of connecting people and super expensive tickets. <laughs> <laughs> that's the key. You know, the one conference that's a little similar to that, at least when I attended, was UX London. They had like the first half of the day was talks and the second half were workshops. And I thought that was pretty good because it's nice to not know you're not like sitting for a full day of talks. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Then you only have to find three speakers. And we already have two right here. We already have two. So you're golden. Part of the thing is that like, it's like why design sprints work so well. There's like these formats that are just defaults and people are like, okay, we put on a conference. Mm. Are we doing one day or two? Are the talks yeah. going to be 30 minutes long? Or are they going to be 45 minutes long? Like people aren't rethinking, generally speaking, most people aren't rethinking like the whole structure and what you want to get out of it. Yeah. A lot of those defaults are just not that good. They could really be improved upon to have a smaller event where people actually get the chance to talk or to put structure around it so people talk or where you don't have to sit and listen to people talk or whatever. It's like all those things yeah. can make it better if you experiment and you don't take the default as law. But isn't a conference a great way to spread my brand and let people know about me, that I'm like this person who is like really good to hire and whatever? I think that's a lot of the reasons why I spoke at conferences before was because I wanted people to know about me and to know about AJ and Smart and to kind of up my profile. At least that's why I said yes to them, right? And obviously, I didn't get paid for a lot of those talks. I don't really think doing something like that is as effective as most other things you can do, to be really, really honest. Like you're standing in a room with 500 people potentially for sure. They're the kind of people who are going to this thing very often to learn as well. So they're not necessarily going to be your like future employer or maybe you do meet like a really cool partner that you end up doing work with. But I think there are other better ways to do that, which I'm not going to get into. But I am a relatively extroverted person. In a conference scenario, I find it very awkward. I find it very hard to talk to people, especially because I don't want them to think that I want something from them. And that's like the conference thing that everyone thinks that you want a job or something. And even when I do a talk and then people come to me afterwards in the after party, like I'm super excited if anyone liked my talk. I'm like, oh my God, thank you so much. I don't like that people think that I am then special because I went up and did something like that. Yeah, you're, you are not. I mean, the other speakers are, but you're, no. you're nobody. Jake, listen up, man. I do the best talks. You should hear my talks. Like me and you, like head to head. We should battle. We should have a talk battle. You would win, I think. No, you know, we have totally different styles. The reason why you might win is because you have like a really, really good, well-structured, really smart talk. The reason why I might win is that I'm quite like boisterous and and like very loud and uh, and go off script and yeah. go kind of crazy and then lose my place. And then people are like, wow, you're so real. And I'm like, no, I really am horribly lost. Help me. <laughs>
I need to leave this place right now. I'm going to disagree with you for a second. I mean, first of all, I would definitely oh, win. Oh, man. But, but about the conference <laughs> talks being good for people to do, there is some advantage to doing it. There's a few things that are good. I mean, like ideally, like if you're doing a talk, you should have some action you're trying to get the audience to take. If you're giving a talk, know what the one thing is you want them to do afterward and try to structure the whole follow talk me on to Instagram. make them do that thing. Okay, follow you on Instagram. Fine. I mean, fine. <laughs> sure, if that's it, sure. But you would structure the talk accordingly. If you do have something in mind that you want them to do or try or read or whatever, like, and you structure the talk so that you can do that, you can achieve something like... Part of the reason why podcasts are great for, it turns out podcasts are, are radio shows, not this kind of podcast, but like doing an interview is a really great way of, like when we were doing Sprint, it was a really great way to promote the book. It is because you have people's attention. You're in their head. You're talking to them for a long period of time. You have the chance to build a case for something. And in that case, the case was, hey, it's a design sprint thing, something you should try. And I have time to explain it to you. I don't just have to give you like a sound bite of it, like a tweet length, you know, sort of pitch about it. Yeah. Similarly, in a talk, you have the opportunity to make a really well-constructed case or argument for your way of thinking or for this thing you want people to do. If you do it well, mm. it can be very, very effective. Having a video of you giving a talk can be a thing that is really nice to have. I don't think that people should like not do it or that you may not automatically get what you want. But if you think it through the lens of what's one thing I want the audience to do and you structure your talk well, you can get people, many people to consider doing that one thing. Okay. What do you think about people who use their conference picture as their profile pictures all over the internet? Oh, <laughs> yeah. With the little uh, flesh colored mic. With the little flesh, with the little flesh mic. <laughs> Although I'm wearing AirPods, uh, so I do look kind of, kind of like a dork I know anyway. the man. And can you please like tap them in a little no, bit? You look like no, such a douche. No, I want them out more. Oh my God. Because I'm not using oh, the mic Jesus. right now. Look at it. You love it. Would you ever do a free conference talk again? I would do TED. That's free. <laughs> okay. It would have to be pretty big, right? It would have to be something like TED. No, actually, I would do a conference that, you know, if I was already in the place... I do actually do talks for free sometimes because I'm in the place where I really feel strongly about right. what the company's doing. Or if I really like feel like I need to promote something like a book and this is a great audience, yeah. I can really get people yeah. excited here. And sometimes I would consider doing it. But yeah, for the most part, especially if you're going to a conference, it's kind of like, I can see how much you're charging for the tickets. I can kind of mentally do the math. I know that you should pay people to talk. It's a lot of work for yeah. them to do to put together a good talk. And it's only fair to your audience members that you try to get the best yeah. speakers. All right. I think that's enough conference talk, but I need to ask you something. Okay. I need to ask you something pretty personal. Oh, God. Did you see what Nintendo did this week? Oh, the cardboardy thing? Oh, my God. Did you see it? Did you watch the video? Yeah, I did watch the video. That looks really cool. I can't believe you actually saw that. Nintendo Labo. Some things are so big, they reach a certain critical mass of people sharing them and talking about them that they even penetrate my bubble of solitude. I did see that. We don't want to talk about the penetration of your bubble on this podcast. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. <laughs> well, I saw it. And at first I was like, oh, God. You know, because sometimes Nintendo, or a lot of the time, they do stuff where you're just like, what are you guys thinking? And then I was like, oh, yeah. no, it's one of those things where you think what are you thinking? And then you're like, it's amazing. Yeah. It looks like it's one of those. so cool. It looks really cool. It's so amazing. Do you have it? When, is, when does it come out? Is it a thing people can buy? It comes out in April. April. Okay. Yeah, there's two different versions of it. So if anyone hasn't seen Nintendo Labo, L-A-B-O yet, first of all, like burn this podcast, go on YouTube and type in Nintendo Labo and watch that. That's why we're mentioning it right at the end of the podcast, because you wouldn't want to listen oh to the rest my of this. God. You're going to just watch that video over and over and over. For me, it's a perfect, beautiful product that I'm sure they spent a lot of time working on. They did it in complete secrecy, and then they released it when it was ready. So there was, I guess, no like iterating on the market. And it's this huge thing. It's basically you have your Nintendo Switch and you buy a Nintendo Labo, which is like a box of different types of cardboard cutouts. And you can turn those into like a giant robot costume, like a piano. For me, that's like the coolest product design thing I've seen in like years. 
My younger son, my mom bought him this like subscription to these boxes that show up. Like it's like a shoe box size cardboard box that shows up. And inside there's like a kit of cardboard or like things that you assemble. It's very similar and it's remarkable how well that kind of stuff actually works. That was the other thing that made me think it was cool. It's like, I've seen how well you like put rubber bands around a thing and you like put a little stick in there and then the cardboard and all of a sudden you got like a machine that totally, it works. And I wonder if they saw something similar to that and were like, oh, but it's amazing. Why do they name it Labo though? Like I know it's got to work in a lot of languages, but I got to think they could have done better. Well, first of all, everybody always thinks Nintendo's naming conventions are bullshit, but they're always right. Like the Nintendo Switch is the best name of all time, but people were kind of irritated about it at the start. I guess it's something Japanese. I mean, maybe it's Lab, but in Japanese. Remember yeah. they're a Japanese company, man. Don't take it out on them. Oh, right, right, right. Well, they named plenty of stuff in, you know, in English, like Super Nintendo. I was in English. I don't understand what you're talking about. I do not get what you're talking about. The other thing, the other cool product design related thing is, and I thought maybe, you know, it's a nice way to end the episode with cool things we've seen. My iPhone 10 arrived after like four months. I went for the white version or the silver version. I got to say something about this product. The internet is such a shithole, Jake. (laughs) (laughs) This is the one I'm telling you about this product. Like, We spoke about Apple in episode two, I think, at at length for about 45 minutes about how it doesn't matter what Apple does. A lot of people were wondering about Apple. They were like, what's the deal with Apple? And we cleared it all up. In episode two, we were like, here's who Apple is. This is what they should do. Everything was clear. This is why everything they do works. If you want to make great products like Apple, exactly. Here's the recipe. We laid it all out. I won't get into it now. Episode two. So we spoke about the fact that it doesn't really matter how good Apple are. They don't really get credit for it because Apple is, what is it? Apple is the mom. Uh, And so like everybody already expects the mom to be great and already do great stuff and whatever. And Google's the dad. Everyone already expects the dad to be a bit of a fuck up and not really do anything. Bumbling dad. Just like, oh, look, I cleaned a dish. Like, oh, good job, dad. (laughs) Good job. (laughs) I didn't light the apartment on fire. And I think (laughs) this is the prime example for me, okay? So in this office, we got the iPhone 10s. We have the iPhone 10 crew, and we have the Pixel 2 crew. Uh, This product is a million times more... Jets and the sharks. Seriously, the iPhone 10 is a beautiful product. It works amazingly. It feels like a super premium, amazing thing. Yeah. And the people in the office as well who bought the Pixel 2s, when they hold it, they also go, oh, okay. That's pretty nice. And like (laughs) everything about it just works like beautifully. So I am 100% blown away by this product, but I thought I wouldn't care about it at all because of reading like reviews of it on The Verge and all of this kind of stuff where everyone's just kind of like, meh, it has a notch. Everybody's expectations are just so too, like, yeah, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want that this doesn't get? This is amazing. This is amazing. It's such a beautiful, like retro looking thing. It's like, oh my God. Do you like yours? Oh yeah. It's so good. You know what it is? It's jewelry. Maybe I already said this in a previous episode. Yeah. They're jewelers. They're like jewelers now, but it is just like this wonderfully crafted, polished, like beach stone in your pocket. It's amazing. And that is the thing. It's like, well, sure. They all do all pretty much the same stuff, but if you're going to get a new one, they're so far ahead on that stuff, on the craftsmanship. Yeah. They're so far ahead. And it's yeah. fun. I just think as like someone who's interested in products, like it's just fun to see like how well they did it. It is also interesting because we're pretty much reaching the point where like the device doesn't matter. Maybe it'll be like a thing that you can bend in the future. And I don't know how why that would be better. You'd probably lose it more easily. But this is like pretty close to like exactly what you want. Size of your hand, the whole thing's a it's screen. It's really beautiful. It's great. It's super interesting to me that I have this weird feeling that people talk about how great the Pixel 2 is because they want to be contrary. Because seriously, the Pixel 2 feels like a crappily built. It literally is like super light, feels super hollow. You can squeeze it. I don't know, man. That thing does not feel like a premium product at all. There's definitely a bit of a thing of like, oh, like you have an iPhone, like so obvious yeah, yeah. why are you overpaying for it you know so like, obvious like, oh it's, like, it's more expensive you're just like a, you're a jerk yeah i love the face id i think it's one of the best things of all time the no button at the bottom is beautiful like i love the animations between going through apps i just think oh my god look at this thing oh have you noticed your notifications are hidden until it notices that you're looking at the phone yeah that's did cool. you notice that how cool is this yeah i actually for me my favorite thing about this phone is 
that it looks kind of like an old school retro Dieter Rams object from the 60s, like the silver version. You know what they've done that's so smart is they have this rotation of materials. So now we're back to iPhone 4, which is Dieter right. Rams, you know, and then they have like roundy land with like the metal. And when they go to aluminum, yeah. when they rotate in aluminum, it gets lighter. But then when they go Dieter Rams yeah. and they go glass, it gets heavier. But yeah. you're like, oh, I haven't seen that in a while. It's retro. It's sweet. And then when they come back with metal again, they're going to be like, it's lighter. And the big headline will be like, lighter than mm. your butt. And then it'll you'll be like, oh, man. <laughs> and you'll want that one. And then they'll come back and they'll be like, Dieter Rams is back again. And you won't care that it's heavier. It's just, it's genius. I think they're going to be doing that for decades, just year after year, cycling through. Jake, I have a question from my Instagram account for you. It's one of the few things we haven't made as a YouTube video, and it's like one of the most common questions I get all the time. So I'm not going to dig through and see the person's name, but thank you for sending this question in. Jake, what are the deliverables of a design sprint? Oh, Learning. Learning and a <laughs> mindset. There is no deliverable. There's no deliverable at the end. There's no uh, thing at the end. The part of the whole idea is to like break out of the cycle of like, there's like a spec. The whole idea is at the end, you've got a prototype, you tested it, but that prototype is probably not going to be what you build. It's going to be what you do with like what you learned. So we learned that this whole thing is a disaster. We're not going to build it. Or we learned that this prototype is pretty good, but we need to fix these few things. That's the most common thing. And our whole team is on the same page about what we're building. Maybe not everybody agrees, but everybody knows how we came to that conclusion and what we're doing. And we know exactly where the path is next. Maybe it's, we need to explore something else. Maybe it's, we're fixing this and going, but it's more that feeling and that momentum and that like, we are in learning mode. We know where we are and we know where we're going and we have a head of steam so we can go fast. That's the deliverable. Cool. Maybe like the literal delivery, like as in what is exactly the thing that gets sent over to our clients at the end of the week. Literally, we do send them the prototype. We send them the raw design files. On Basecamp, we send them like a kind of one pager report of what we would recommend, especially because they're going to take this in-house. It's a one pager report of what we would recommend based on the user tests that they now do once they take that in-house. And um, very often we will do, let's say if the prototype had a few different features in it, but only a couple of them really worked out with the users, we'll give them like an effort impact scale where we show them which features we recommend that they would implement first or which parts of the product we would implement first and in what order. And then we just give a quick breakdown of all the user testing results, like the big picture results. And we give them some recommendations then based on how they work internally, whether that's Agile or Waterfall, we give them recommendations of how we would now plug that back into their company. That's fair. I mean, and actually, you know, the other thing I might add to my answer to be more concrete is this idea that you start with the sprint questions on Monday of your sprint. When I'm running a sprint with a team nowadays, I look at the end of the week for them to have still those sprint questions, but to have answers to some of those questions. And then the other part of the deliverable is like, these are probably the questions we need to answer next. These questions, we have not satisfactorily proven our solution, so we need to push further. And I think that idea of like, there's questions we need to answer, and we've made some progress, and we have some gaps, is another simple thing that can come out of it. I thought of a really great way to frame the design sprint, especially if you're trying to get a company internally to adopt it. It's about framing it as looking at the opportunity cost of not doing a design sprint. And the opportunity cost of not doing a design sprint is potentially months of going in circles, discussing things, but without having any tangible results. Whereas the sprint sort of short circuits that and gets to the point which could take months extremely quickly. It almost bulldozes that whole process that usually is very slow and constant meetings and all of this stuff spread out over months happening in four days. So you have your opportunity cost of not doing it. That's really interesting because what you're basically saying is there's the way you do it now, there's a risk. Like you don't know it because yeah. it's what you do all the time, but it's actually risky. Yeah. The risk is that you'll do what you always do and we will do what we always do and we'll waste a bunch of time. That's interesting. So it's like, rather than this is a new thing, it's like what you're already doing is the disaster. <laughs> 
Hell yeah. Jake, do you think that um, I come across as like the total asshole and you come across as the nice guy in this podcast? I just feel like thinking about this podcast, about how aggressive I was about the conference and the last episode about how aggressive I was as well. And you're always like the voice of reason. I think I feel like it's probably <laughs> oh, good yeah, dynamic. Well, I mean, we should leave it to the listeners. Maybe we should have a poll or something. I would yeah. guess that we both sounded a bit arrogant this time. We're talking to conferences and everything and, uh, yeah. you know, masking our own insecurity about talking but if i'm playing my cards the way i want to yeah i look like the good guy you look like the jerk but we still are arguing because people like arguments that's what i'm going for mission accomplished that's good jake where can people find you on the internet jakenap.com twitter at jake k and i would uh definitely recommend signing up for the newsletter if you're listening to this podcast you might as well sign up for uh for my sprint newsletter on the sprintbook.com jonathan where can people find you? People can find me on Instagram at J Ice Cream. And if you want to uh, follow me on Twitter, which I don't really use, but it looks great when people want to ask me to speak at conferences. Hey, hey. <laughs> seriously, you know how many people ask me how many Twitter followers I have if they want to ask me. So yeah, follow me on Twitter at J Ice Cream as well. So I'm at J Ice Cream everywhere you look. But actually, recently, in recent days, Um, Where I've been spending a lot of my time is on this Innovation Hackers group on Facebook. So just type in Innovation Hackers into Facebook. Crazy conversations going on there. (laughs) Hyper-aggressive design conversations. Hacking innovation. Innovation is being hacked left and right. It's just the most cliche name of all time. People have power gloves on. Innovation's been turned upside down it, in that <laughs> Facebook group. It's funny that it. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that this um, group actually took off because the name was obviously kind of like a bit of a sarcastic joke by me. You know, like innovation hackers. Let's just do that. And now, now yeah, it's like almost 500 it. people. And yeah, now I'm stuck with it. Um, no, but it's really great. Go to Innovation Hackers. Uh, Jake is not posting anything there, but we're posting about Jake all the time. Good. That's as as it should be. Love you, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. We can say we can sing the song out. Product, product breakfast, breakfast club. club. Bum, bum, Speaking of bum, names bum. that we made up, bum, and bum, now we're kind of stuck bum. with product breakfast club. Bum, 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 bum. Product breakfast club. Product breakfast club. Product breakfast club. Bye.